um, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here and feel excited. And I want to first of all take the opportunity to just to thank the Prize for Life and also the Dream Challenge for just organizing and hosting this challenge and also make it happen. And my name is Guang Li, and I'm with my colleague Liu Xia Wang here. And we are from the company called Santroner. So just to take another opportunity to just make some advertisement about our company. Actually, we are based in Washington, D.C., and we are a scientific marketing company that we use a lot of quantitative approach, such as mathematics, modeling, statistics, mo uh, machine learning, and, 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 op and optimization to help our clients to solve their business problems in marketing domain, such as how to find the optimal price for certain products and how to figure out what is the best selling opportunity for uh, certain customers. So today my topic is going to be uh, pretty straightforward. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the problem and its challenges. And I think I will go through very quickly for this one because I, have, I think you guys have a lot of context about you know, the problem itself. And then we just introduce the kind of like the techniques for us to process the data, do the exploration analysis. And also I'm going to introduce the structure of the model and as well as the results and conclusions we have. And for the last part, we think that is probably be very, very kind of like interesting to talk about some implications we have from our model. So for the first part, uh, for the, first part the problem itself is actually pretty pretty straightforward. It's like to use the data from the first three months to predict the future progression rate of ALS in the month three to month 12. And I, I want to just talk a little bit about the challenges here because that really, really just make me suffer a lot during the competition. It's so first of all, there is no problem called causal relationship and factors for, you know, for this type of disease, uh, which also makes this challenge interesting but it's also painful. And the data, the data is actually very, very dirty because uh, there is a lot of missing data for, for a lot of different variables and there are a lot of, you know, the scale is different, there is a lot of different measurement for different variables. And also there are so many data. I know that Price for Life wants to give us as many data as possible. Uh, I thank for that, but that really makes our, our life really hard. So we need to figure out a kind of like a good techniques for the variable selection to figure out, okay, this is the best informative variable that we, we're going to use rather than just put everything into our model. So actually our goal is actually to fold it. So first of all, we want to discover if there are any interesting variables or interactions of these variables um, that can be used as a future kind of like buy makers for the ARS progression. And second one is like we try as hard as possible to just design a, uh, an algorithm with a bad accuracy. So the first part for us is first step is trying to figure out what is the right data for use to as input of the model. So this decision is actually based on uh, cri uh, based on a criteria based on two criteria. So first of all, we do some literature review. It has been shown that in a lot of research. Some, some kind of factors have, has already been identified in both significant, significant and, and effective to predict the future ARS progression. For example, the location for the onset, the age, and some lab tests, for example, the euro asset value, and also the time difference between you know, the, uh, the onset and, and the diagnose. And second criteria is actually we, we, we take a look very intensively at the data and trying to figure out, okay, this is, this is the data we want to use. Um, so the first very intuitive thing come to our mind is actually, since we use the historical data to predict the future, then it is, must be very informative for, you know, we use the first three months data. So we found that like, uh, for a lot of patient cases, actually um, the, uh, the ARS, uh, ARS, FRS, uh, ARS FRS score is actually consistent with their future progression. But the bad thing is that for a lot of times, there are a lot of noises for the first three months data. Um, there are a lot of fluctuations and variations. So we want to consider both together. So the way we do that is actually, first of all, in order to take this information, we just fit a nine for the first three months EOS FRS score and then use that slope as a, pre as a predictor. And also we define an MSC, the mean, uh, the mean squared arrow to represent the credibility of this score. 
And second thing that is actually pretty interesting, because for a lot of research that has done already, uh, people tend to just look at this score uh, as a whole. I mean, look at the total score. But we, we'd rather to think, OK, why not just to take a more gradient level, which we actually, first of all, we look at the 10 questions. Because if you look at these 10 questions, you'll find that actually it represents the different functionality for different body parts. So for example, the first uh, three questions, speech, salvation, and, and morning, is actually, actually present you know, how your face muscle works. works. Uh, so, so based, based on, on this, and also we have the uh, metrics for the correlation for these 10 questions for this score. And we find that actually we can divide them into five groups, so such as face, and body, back, and chest. And there are some interesting uh, things here. So first of all, you'll see that the hand and body, actually, these two parts, they are correlated with each other very much. But actually, for the face and the chest, the correlation value with other body parts is actually relatively small. So we think probably we can just you know, treat these five different parts differently and just put their score and slope into our model. And another interesting thing that we actually uh, we look at the initial con uh, health condition for each patient, and we find that there are actually some nonlinear relationship. Um, we just fit a quadratic, a very simple quadratic model for uh, uh, between the slope, the future slope, and the EOS FRA score at, for the last trial at the, at, at the first three months. And we can see that there is actually the first uh, order and second order term, they are both very, very significant. And uh, if you look at this curve, you can see that, OK, when the score is larger than 26, actually it is positively correlated with each other. But when it is smaller than 26, it's actually negatively correlated, correlated with each other. So this is kind of very interesting because the possible explanation can be, you know, if people have already have a high score, which will present a relatively healthy state, or have already come to a bad situation, probably that means they've already come to some stable uh, kind of state, that the future dege uh, degeneration of the hair's condition will be kind of like slow compared to others. And also, I think another very interesting factor we identify, I think another team also uh, talked about that is actually the time difference between the onset uh, and the, the time we measure. So we also do some data transformation that if we assume that uh, the patient is Health condition is pretty good uh, when when just uh, get onset. So the total score should be the full marks, which is 40, 40 zero. And then if you just minus the uh, first try AF, AAS, FRI score and divide it by the time difference, this is actually another source of historical information about the pro progression snow we can use. So. So um, actually, this is just uh, it's kind of like selected variables I'm talking about. Actually, we define a lot of variables. So first, first part is actually the information for the first three months EOS FR score information. So as you can see, we have a slope for three months. We have a slope for the onset. And we also kind of like measure the different body part differently. We define the score for, for each five group. And also, we define the channel rate for five group. And except for that, we also have information such as onset information and the family history. If there any family member has diagnosed with EOS before, or you know the, uh, the vital capacity information, and there are some kind of like uh, t uh, the result from the lab test we can utilize, and also the vital signs such as you know uh, the weight, the 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 pulse, and the you know the the the, the breathing rate. So in terms of handling the missing data, for the data that has a lot of missing values, we define a binary variable to indicate if this variable is missing or not. For the variable that has just, just kind of like small amount of missing data, we just you know, impute using the mean or the mode of the data. So we propose to use a random forest algorithm. Uh, I guess a lot of you guys must have, must, you know, very familiar with this algorithm, but I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, the overall kind of idea. So random forest is actually an example classifier, and that it just uh, generates a lot of different independent uh, regression trees, uh, but yeah, just from the subset of the data, and then trying to aggregate the result as an output of the model. So 
But we feel like it is probably not a good idea to just throw all our data into just one model because of the data characteristics we have. So if you look at the variables, for example, for like euro asset value and the time difference between the onset and diagnose, they are actually as high as about 80% of the data are missing. So due to the kind of instance that random forest work, because it just uses kind of like aggregate result and just voting for the, the, the best uh, prediction it can have, that means these kind of two variables, their, their kind of like uh, explanation power will be greatly diluted. Another thing is that actually there are some inconsistent measurements for different type of variables. For example, for the vital capacity, each patient either have a faster vital capacity or a slow vital capacity. But actually, it is, uh, if we just fit a two different separate linear model for these two variables, you'll see that the coefficient is, coefficient is actually vastly different. So we don't want to put them together and just use a combined model. So we co come up with the idea to maybe to take care of the different situation uh, respectively. So we have this mixed model, we call it a mixed model, and so there are actually four models. The base model is actually just based on all the data, and we use a binary indicator to indicate if it is missing or not. And for the submodel one, we actually we just uh, uh, develop it on the subset of data if the, app, uh, if the fast wider capacity data is available. And for the submodel two, we actually depends on if the euro asset value is available or not, and for the submodel three, it actually depends on, you know, the diagnose delta uh, data, which is the time difference between onset and diagnose, if it is available. And we do that, we just test it on the, on the, on the test data. And um, it seems like compared to the base model, each submodel, just on that particular subset of data, they, per, they perform you know, better in terms of the reduction of RMSD. So if you look at this number, you probably think, okay, yes, it's, it does not matter, just a small number, but if you think about, you know, how close each solution with each other and how difficult for us to improve the accuracy, even like one percentage is actually pretty significant, pretty significant for us. And this result is actually consistent when we do on the validation data. And also the logic for combining this model is actually pretty straightforward because we first of all use a model that can improve the accuracy, uh, accuracy most. And then for the remaining data, we go to the second model that is, you know, relatively uh, increased uh, accuracy a little bit, and then we come, finally, we come to the base model. So to summarize, I think, uh, first of all, um, we, we achieved the accuracy of for RMSD, which is uh, 0, 0, 0, 05, 112, compared to the baseline algorithm, which is 0, 0, 0.053. And because we do a lot of cross-validation for the variable selection, we successfully avoid the problem of overfitting that a lot of kind of like uh, challenging participants they encounter. And also we successfully identify a lot of very, very interesting relationships and dynamics and a lot of new variables. Maybe it's kind of like interesting for the future to study. And also from the random forest point of view, it has a very inherent uh, matrix to measure the variable importance. So we, we can see that from, from our model, uh, the length of the time from on onset, the deterioration the rate from onset till now, the uh, changing rate for the wider capacity, you know, uh, the ARS, the FRS score change rate, they are kind of like top most important variables. So if you look at this, this is actually the, var the variable importance for different, for the four models you'll find that actually for all of them, they are, they are consistent. But if you look at, for example, for the uh, submodel two, you'll see that the euro asset value just rank, uh, rank a little bit higher because here we just take care of this one particularly. And it is also true uh, for the submodel three, which is you can see the onset di diagonal delta difference is also uh, the third most important. So, what does that mean? We don't want to just have a kind of like accuracy and just give to a price for life. And okay, we'll go away and we take the money, and, you know. So um, w we think that from a, an outsider's point of view who has not any experience in computational biology, bioinformatics, or ARS disease, probably we can, just from our model, there are some interesting implications. So first thing we think about is like, is there any different stages for this disease? 
Because first thing is that uh, if you think about the most important variable actually are the time difference from the onset. That means it is not time independent. Second is like if there is a stages for different patients, is there heterogeneity for the length of the kind of like stage for each patient? And what kind of factors actually contribute to this difference across these patients? So probably some, some kind of variables, it does not just affect this progression rate directly, they just, uh, through some certain structures, they affect the length of the stages, and then it will demonstrate different progression rates. And second thing that here we have, uh, uh, we have seen this matrix again, is that um, would, would be it more beneficial to look at the different body parts independent, uh, kind of like uh, individually rather than combine them together? Because there are so many interesting correlation here. So is there any reasons that, you know, from the disease perspective of view that actually why certain body parts, they are correlated with each other are more than other, you know, the, the body part. And also, uh, I mean, just based on my naive kind of like intuition, like, is that possible that for certain neutrons that control these body muscles, they actually, they're close with each other or far from each other, that will contribute to their correlation. And also, is there any transmission mechanism? Because the chest muscle is always, a, for most of the time, the last one to deteriorate. So I think there is a lot of things to do in the future. I think, yeah, that is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. So does anyone have some questions? Seems people are just eager for them. <laughs> yeah, everyone's really eager. Um, I, I have some papers to send you because that, that's exactly one of the latest trends in the field is, is this correlation and distance between the neurons in the brain wow. and, and the body parts. So thank you. Um, so 